Good morning. We're glad that you're here with us at Carlson Memorial United Methodist Church. Welcome to those who are with us and those who are online. We're going to begin by singing our opening hymns, Come Ye Thankful People Come, and Wonderful Words of Life. You may stand or sit as you feel comfortable. be seated. I want to read a scripture just as we're starting. It's out of John 15. It says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. Well, yesterday we uh, remembered a horrific day 20 years ago. And then we all know that we woke up the next morning and it was still there, but you were, we were all patriots at that time. And the Jesus and the God that was serving back then that saved those souls and took them to heaven that were Christians, he's still active today. He is still working and walking among us. And I want us to feel that love and that comfort each and every day. So yes, we knew he was active back then, but he still is today, amen? All right, I want to say welcome to everybody. It's good to see you here today. I want to say good morning to those that are uh, live streaming with us as well. 
If you are a first time guest, I'd like you to uh, fill out one of the tan cards that's in the, on the pew there, fill it out and take it to uh, the lobby afterwards and we have a gift bag we'd like to get in your hands. Prayer requests and praise reports. We're always looking forward to those praise reports. You know, we, we lift up so many needs that we know that we have. But yet also, let's bring those praise reports in because God is still a miracle working God and he is healing and that's when we want to praise him. So in the pews are the white prayer cards and we want you to print, please, if you want to put a prayer request or a praise report, please print because uh, Pastor Victoria will read them to us uh, at the time of prayer. You see the little fish in the pews and those are for any of us who have done work in the name of Carlson out in the community. That we've shared Jesus some way, we've done some type of work in his name out in the community and we'd like you to put those in the offering plates as well. Uh, church wants to thank all of those who helped with Woody's funeral on Friday. Our little 109-year-old man, that would have been 110 come December. And he is rejoicing with the Lord today and watching us in worship here as well. And we're going to just miss seeing him come in. And what always just blew my mind is that when he was coming regularly, he was driving here. And <laughs> I just, uh, I thought that was really quite remarkable. But the church does want to thank everyone who helped with the service, the feeding of the family, because they were all so appreciative of it. There are other announcements in your bulletin, and I hope you got one. If not, I'm sure there's some still out in the lobby, and if you would get one, please. Uh, if you would, please stand for our opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord, often we come to worship torn between the way of comfort and the way of radical selflessness and joy. Sometimes we come to worship feeling lost about which path to take. Sometimes we can't even find the path. Help us understand courage and love from you that will transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, take time, uh, turn and greet your neighbors or walk across the room and say hello. And that does it for me. This is, this is easy. Good morning, church. We're going to begin our time of worship here. We're going to begin our time of worship here. And it's great to see all these familiar faces, faces we haven't seen for a while, faces we see every week, some we see more often, new faces. And we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's an amazing truth to hold on to. There's a common theme through a few of these songs, and it's about hitting your knees. And that's about surrendering to God. Sometimes, a lot of times, we struggle with God. God, I want this. God, why are you doing this? God, why did you let this happen? But as we're singing these songs today, I want you to think our action is hitting our knees and praising God for who he is. So we would love it, and I know God would love it even more if you guys would sing with your hearts to him this morning.
sound of a symphony in my ears Like holy water, your forgiveness My sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony in my ears Like holy water As we prepare to give and receive, Lord, we do so with the hope that our hearts, our actions will likewise follow. 
Guide our hearts, minds, and lives to the ways that bring you joy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Let's join in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Please be seated, and I'd like to invite our children to come forward. Good morning. Oh, so, I mean, let's be honest. There's some of us out here who know a little bit about bingo, and there's others that don't. All right, I'm not saying anything, <laughs> but some of us are probably more familiar. This is my little bingo wheel, and I got this at Target last night at the Dollar Spot, which is a great location if you want to go. And I, Stephanie was like, what are you doing for your children's moment tomorrow? I was like, you know, I always kind of wrestle with this over the weekend, and Sometimes I just find something that's like, wow, that's what I need to talk about. I saw this bingo wheel. She's like, why are you buying that? I was like, for my children's moment. So here it is. You guys know what a bingo uh, wheel does? It, yeah, so it pulls out a number. We get to spin this cool little tumbler, this basket. Um, um, you a little, like, uh, a thing that has a dot, and then if you have that, um, like, letter or number, then you stamp the dot down onto that one, and then get it into a row, then you win. Have you been playing secret bingo behind my back? She knew a lot about it there. Oh no, she's been watching professional bingo. So this is the bingo thing, and it's really just a game of chance. You know, you could increase your chances by getting more of the little uh, numbers and all that, and more of the little papers, but it's just a game of chance. There's no real way that you're gonna win over somebody else. So you just kind of spin it, we'll, we'll spin it in a second, but I want you guys to think of a few numbers, and I, I promise this will get to a good point here in a second. But I want you guys to think of a few numbers, each and every one of you, because I might call on you. And we're gonna see if you can guess which number might come out. We're gonna see how well this might work. All right, every, everybody have a number? Yeah. All right, hold on, you guys got numbers? Raise your hand if you got a number. All right, let me spin it. This thing's pretty cool, actually. Let's see what we do. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, we lost one. Hold on. That's all right. That's all right. 
Here, Emmy, hold the other side. No, hold the bottom. There we go. We got some coming out. Now, remember, this is from the dollar spot. This is not an official. <laughs> oh, no. All right, so we'll pull a few out. All right. Kate, what was your number? 100? Oh, it's number 11. You were pretty close, though. Wyatt, what was your number? Three. Three. 73? Again, you're pretty close. Samaya, what was your number? 10? 72. All right, not, okay. Emmy? 59. Uh oh, closer. All right, Lucas, what about you? 20. 14. Oh man, we're getting closer. Mikel, what about you? 74. What's your name? Storm? What's your number, buddy? 86. Let me see what we got here. Six. Oh man. Here, let, let me do one. Let me do one. Let's, uh, I'll say 72. Let's see. Oh, it's 10. I thought somebody said 10. All right, so we all lost. All right, so let's sit back down. I know this could be super distracting. So, Mikel, get over here. I told you. All right, so none of us won. We're all, we're all losers up here. No, no, I'm just kidding. But we all lost. But sometimes we can think of prayer like this, almost like a game of chance. Hey, I'm going to say this prayer, and I'm going to hope that it was said in the exact perfect way at the exact right time, in the exact right manner for the exact right thing, and God's going to grant it to me. And if he didn't, it's because I did something wrong. Okay, let me, let me just roll the tumbler again. Let me just throw a bunch of prayers out there. Oh, God, God, give me... And we, we you end up using him like he's a bingo machine. We end up using him like he's some sort of scratch ticket or like he's some sort of magic genie. And we think prayer is a chance, but prayer is not a chance. In Acts chapter 10, there's this guy named Cornelius, and he's a centurion, which means he's a soldier in charge of over 100 people. And it said that he was devout, and he prayed regularly, and he gave to people in need. And then this angel of the Lord appears to him, and he says, guess what? Your prayers and your good deeds have come up as an offering to the Lord. And it's real easy for us just to be like, oh, cool, the, the Lord wanted to choose him. We need to understand what's important there. Your prayers and your good deeds came up before the Lord. Your prayers, whenever they don't get answered, whenever they don't get responded to in the way you want, the thing to remember is they're always heard. God hears each and every one of our prayers. It's not a game of chance with God. He's not saying, here's the magic door behind which one you have to choose. If we're praying regularly, and I can guarantee you, Cornelius wasn't praying to send some people on a journey to go meet a guy that he had never met. But that's what the Lord gave him. He said, your prayers have come up, so I trust you with the task. So sometimes when we pray for things, it's showing our commitment to God. So we need to ask ourselves, are we praying regularly? Are we praying enough and doing enough for God for him to see us as somebody he can trust to do his will on earth, to bring him glory here? And the other thing is God answers prayers when he wants to. In that same story, Cornelius is very specific. Cornelius gets his vision from this uh, angel at three in the afternoon. It tells us that. And then Peter, who he's supposed to meet, gets a vision at noon the next day. God, what are you doing? Just give him the vision at the same time, right? No, he took his time. He took his time. And you know what? He's allowed to because he's God. And we're his creation. We need to remember that. So do not treat your prayer life, which I hope you guys all have healthy ones. And if not, there's no better day to start than today. I know there's going to be a lot of prayers because football's back in full swing. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of pr more prayers than usual. Maybe not good prayers, but there's going to be some prayers. It'll be good practice. But seriously, guys, we need to pray and not treat it like a game of chance. God listens to each and every one of your prayers, and you never know when they're going to come up as an offering to the Lord. And he might not answer them the way you want to, but he might say, you know what, Kate? I can't give you that right now, but I got an awesome job for you to do. And we all need to be ready to say, okay, I'll go. All right? All right, just remember, our odds were not good with bingo, so we shouldn't treat it like that. But God does listen to each and every one of us. He loves us. All right, we'll bow our heads, pray, and we're actually going to make some grasshoppers in there. We're going to do a study on John the Baptist, so we're going to make some locusts. So, <laughs> All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much 
that, uh, yeah, we can just, again, have lessons from just anything. The dollar spot at Target has produced many uh, biblical lessons at this church, and uh, it's just great that you reveal yourself in so many different ways. But we do want to be serious and realize, Lord, that we have been praying wrong sometimes. Our hearts have been wrong. Our prayer tends to be more, God, I love you, but I also have this request. And we are supposed to bring all of our requests and petitions to God. Lord, but we're also supposed to honor you. And we just pray that we can continue to do that, Lord, that we can trust you. We can trust your timing. And maybe you're already working in other people for the chance that we're going to meet up when you call us to meet them. Lord, you're always at work, like was talked about earlier with Miss Diane. You're the same God that you were 20 years ago. That's the same God you were 2,000 years ago. That's the same God you were when there was nothing but darkness, Lord. And you separated, and here we are. Lord, we're separated from you currently, but only because of our sin. But you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to remove that separation that we can walk with you again like it was in the beginning. Lord, allow our prayers to be more than just hopes. Lord, I hope you do this. Lord, I hope you let it be. Lord, I love you. I praise you. This is the desire of my heart. I leave it all to you. And how much easier will all of our lives be if that's how we act? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Oh, you can When it first happened, the minutes felt like hours, the hours felt like days, and the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built, wars were fought, victims' names were read. Survivors tried to pick up the pieces over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories. We will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that. One thing stays constant. One thing is steady. God. God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He's closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns, and we will always remember.
we have a number of prayer updates. Alice's, Alice Pontius's sister Joyce passed away early this morning. Her sister Shirley is doing better. Also pray for Sandra. Uh, she died on September 12th of COVID. Also pray my, for my landlord who has COVID and pray for Connor Coe's family. A three-year-old from Immokalee passed away from cancer last week. On your prayer um, sheet that is in your bulletin, anything that is bold is a new and ongoing prayer concern. So you'll see that as you read through. So let's join together with our prayer requests and our sheets in our hands and bring all of our concerns, those spoken and those unspoken before the Lord. A loving God, as we spend this moment in prayer and open our hearts to you. We remember all of our leaders in churches and ministries. We remember those who died in 9-11 and those who were responders and just jumped in and helped where they could. We pray for those in areas of war and disruption, for those who are struggling with hurricanes and earthquakes and fires, floods. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for those who are dealing with COVID in the hospital at home, who are grieving the loss of loved ones and friends. We pray for those who are not able to be with us, who are at home and in facilities. We pray for those who are in rehab, nursing homes and assisted living. We pray for those in hospice. We pray for those who are sick <coughs> and struggling and those who are in grief. We pray for those who feel alone and disconnected. We pray for those whose family are beside them holding their hand. We pray for those who are alone at home we pray for those who are serving in our armed forces. We pray for our churches and we pray for ourselves as we continue to ask you to help us walk in your way, to be led by your spirit and to be guided by your grace. And as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, help us remember that many pray this prayer in open and in secret. And yet we join our voices together <clears throat> and pray as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, 
And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he told them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and look at, looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? What, then, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. <clears throat> May God add his understanding to the reading and hearing of his holy word. You know, a lot of times we think that being a follower is not something we should really encourage. I don't remember any college commencement speaker ever graduating the class or congratulating the graduating class for becoming the followers of tomorrow. <clears throat> Nobody frames their resume to highlight when they exercise good followership skills. No one's heart swells with pride when a parent says, you know, your kid is a real follower. In fact, we used to say, don't be a follower, be a leader, don't follow the crowd, and then we invented social media with Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So now you can follow people's tweets and posts and channels, and they can become an influencer. It's a very strange thing. And Jesus' disciples had a problem with this, too, although they didn't have, of course, Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. Jesus' disciples have been following him. They've seen everything he's done. They've heard everything he has said. But they don't seem to really grasp what's going on. Jesus wants to know how much of all of this they've kind of been getting. And so he asks them, who do you say that I am? And after a little bit of back and forth, Peter comes up with the answer and he says, you are the Messiah. But you can have the right answer and not understand how you got there. You know, I remember math class where they always made me check my work. I just sort of, you know, wrote stuff down and I didn't know how I got there. And most of my answers were wrong. So how I got there wasn't right anyway. So I'm like, why should I show you how I made a mistake? Yeah. Just a few verses later, though, and you can tell that Peter doesn't get it because a few verses later, he completely gets it wrong. Jesus tells them what's going to happen. He's going to be crucified. He's going to rise from the dead. And Peter grabs Jesus by the arm and says, basically, stop talking like that. No Messiah will suffer and be rejected and die on a cross. What kind of a Messiah is that? Jesus gives them the answer to the question, what kind of Messiah will he truly be? If anyone becomes, wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. But we need to understand what Jesus means. We assume pretty much that life is ours to do as we please. It belongs to us. And then we cling to dear, for dear life to people and money and possessions, 
our youthfulness, the neighborhood, the prestige of our job, how well our children are doing in school. We often hold on to all the perks because we think we earned them or are owed them. We often hold on to fear because we're afraid of change. A recruiter for a program that was recruiting bright young folks from college to teach in some of the most deprived areas in the US came to visit a stellar university. Looking out at the auditorium full of the brightest and best, the recruiter said, looking at you tonight, I don't know why I'm here. I can tell that you are bound for success, and here I stand trying to recruit you to spend a year in some of the worst places you will ever see. But I do have some literature up here, and I would be willing to talk to anyone who happens to be interested. She sold that like my father used to sell magazines where he'd walk up to someone's house, knock on the door, the person would answer, and my father would say, you don't want to buy any magazines, do you? He was the world's worst magazine salesman. <laughs> you don't want to go over here, do you? Now, the recruiter was absolutely astonished when a lot of students came forward because they wanted to do something more important with their life. So what is Jesus getting at when he says, take up your cross? Usually when people say, ah, this is my cross to bear, what we're really saying when you get down to the nut of it is that we mean that suffering is imposed upon us and we endure it without complaint. But that's not what Jesus is saying. We do not take up our cross and endure it because it has been put upon us and imposed against our will. That is not redemptive. Suffering on the cross was not imposed on Jesus. He accepted it willingly, intentionally, to redeem all. To take up our cross and follow Jesus means we follow him, <clears throat> refusing to only think about ourselves. We willingly take up the burden of others. We willingly take up forgiveness and compassion and transformation and reconciliation. But what do we do about the fear? What do we do about our fear of change, our fear of transformation, our fear of others, our fear of the future, our want to return to the past? I like this statement, pray entrust your future, your body, your goals, and your life to God. Maybe we ought to put that on a sign. Pray, entrust your future, your body, your goals, your life to God, and others too. Here's the part we skip when we read this particular passage, and it is extremely important for us not to skip over it. The way we carry our cross is for my sake, Jesus says, and for the sake of the gospel. There's nothing hidden here. There's no fine print. There's no hidden agenda. Jesus wants us to know exactly what we're getting into when we pick up our cross willingly and carry it for his sake and the sake of good news. Because what he's also saying on the flip side of this is playing it safe involves a risk. In fact, playing it safe involves the biggest risk of all. Because when we decide to play it safe, when we decide to live our life in a way and only go a certain step and no further, we decide to live our faith 
We play it safe. We don't do it for God's gain. We do it for our own. We go from God sacred to us scared. Have you ever noticed that there's only one letter that moves in both those words? Sacred, scared. One letter difference. It's a powerful change. When we play things safe, we forget that we are in the presence and the power of the sacred. But we also use this, I think, sometimes in a kind of um, um, sort of off-center way. We power on ahead and we say, I am not afraid of anything that... And we throw prudence out the window and we throw consideration out the window and... Jesus calls us to discipleship of our whole self, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and he calls us to love our neighbor as Jesus loves us. So if we want Christ to forgive us, we forgive. If we want Christ to transform us, we help in transformation. If we want compassion from the Lord, we give compassion. It's about abundant life, overflowing life. Absolutely stupendous life. My mother would refer to something like that as great, big, huge. Not just great, not just big, not just huge. Great, big, huge. But how do we live that kind of life? Richard J. Foster was a Quaker. Actually, he still is. And he wrote a number of books about spirituality and prayer and transformation. And he writes from personal experience about the freedom Jesus gives us. He says, in surrender, we are free to value other people. So when we take up our cross willingly to engage with people, not to stand apart from them, in that surrender, we, free, we are free to value other people. Their dreams and plans become important to us. We have entered into a freedom to give up what we want for others, for the good of others. For the first time, we love people unconditionally. We don't expect them to return our love. We don't feel that we have to be shown a specific way to be loved. We can rejoice in their success. We can feel genuine sorrow at their failures. If their plans succeed and our plans are frustrated, that is neither here nor there. We are happy. We discover it is far better to serve our neighbor. Now there's a caveat here. If the relationship is one of abuse and pain, that's a whole different thing. That's not carrying your cross. And we don't really like the word surrender very much because we don't really do that very well. So what does this look like? Here's the thing about living this way. It doesn't mean that the fear goes away. It means Christ walks with us in the midst of that fear. It means that just because we are in a tumultuous time that we don't have to be afraid to lean on the strength of others. It means that we lean more on the strength of God than we do on our own. It's easy to talk about, it's not always easy to do. <clears throat> As we have seen over and over when we are dealing with things that make us uncomfortable or fearful. I remember a time when <clears throat> I ran into this like running straight into a brick wall. I got a call 
from my sister to tell me that one of my nephews had stage four cancer. He was 23 years old. He had tumors everywhere, and it was the second most aggressive cancer on the planet. He told my sister he would rather die than be in the kind of pain that he was experiencing. I didn't know what to say to God. Because to ask for him to be saved meant he would be in pain. But I couldn't ask that he be fully healed and died. So I talked to a friend of mine and I said to him, I don't know what to say. And my friend sent me a message and said, this is what you pray. Be with us all. Lord, be with us all. Be with us all. I had to say that every single day. <clears throat> and then he ran into a doctor who was sick and tired of his patients dying of this cancer. So this doctor <clears throat> and another um, man in uh, the field of immunization came up with a new cancer treating drug. It supercharged his immune system and he is cancer free for three years. He's got two more to go. When he started, he had tumors in his lungs, his spine, his stomach, his liver, his arms, and his legs. There are none left. Now, there was one other thing I did I cranked up everybody I knew <clears throat> to pray for him. And I thank God for those doctors, and I thank God for his people who were around him, and my sister who had to stay with him, and all the people who prayed for him. We all worked together. Be with us every day. Be with us every day. And then the prayer began to change to help him go through this, help him be stronger, help the doctors and nurses, help the hospital. I talked to a friend of mine yesterday <clears throat> who was outside one of the local hospitals in Fort Myers. And she said there was a chaplain there wearing a chaplain badge who was standing outside the hospital praying for everybody in the hospital. This is how you walk through times of fear. And everybody will do it slightly differently. I have to surrender pretty much every day because sometimes I surrender stuff and then I go get it back. Oops, sorry, wait. Not, not done with that yet. Bring it back. I, I still need to chew on that one for just a wee while. And, you know, it's like a suitcase. You put it on the conveyor belt and then you grab it back. But for me, this is action. It requires effort on my part. I don't always let go easily. And I've noticed sometimes the church doesn't either. Because we're scared, and yet we just need to move one letter for sacred. Surrounded by God's love, walking with Christ through this time of difficulty. Peter had the same problem. And so did all the disciples. They were fine with following Jesus until he pulled out the, I'm going to die on the cross and be raised from the dead. It wasn't Peter's plan. He didn't want to lose Jesus. He knew that messiahs didn't do that. They didn't die on crosses. They didn't, it just wasn't part of the, 
way that we thought about that, he doesn't understand. It's too painful, it's too scary. So he wants to back up and play it safe and have his own little zone where you just don't cross that boundary. And yet sometimes you cross that boundary. I heard someone described like this at their memorial service. They were always ready to stop whatever they were doing for someone who had a need. They didn't mind being interrupted. They made, remained unconcerned about themselves and cared more for others and wanting to do for friends and family and those they'd never met. Reminds me of my grandmother. We called her Mama Re. Whenever she would get on an airplane, we would have two questions when we met her at the gate. What color would her hair be? She had many wigs, and they were all different colors. So which colored wig would she be wearing? And how many people would be following her as she got off the plane? Because she was not a woman who would sit in the seat and be quiet and sedate. Now, she was a little lady. She was shorter than I am. And when she sat down in her airplane seat, she would look around <clears throat> and she would introduce herself to the person sitting next to her. And then she would get up and she would introduce herself to the people across the aisle. And then she would walk up and down the plane and introduce herself to everyone on the airplane. And she would know their name. She would know their dog's names. She would know their grandchildren's names. She would get their addresses and phone numbers and keep in touch with them. And so when she would get off the plane, there'd be 30, you know, 20 or 10 or 15 or one time an entire plane full of strangers. Hi, Marie, have a great time. Is this your family? Oh, this must be Victoria. We had no idea who these people were. No clue. That's how she traveled. She used to say, I don't wanna just sit in my seat. It's way more fun to visit. And they were a captive audience and couldn't escape her. When we'd go through customs, it used to take a long time because she would ask every customs person, your name, where you're from, do you have children? They'd look at her like she was nuts, but she loved it. And when they gave her kind of a brush off, she wouldn't be upset, she'd just move on. She had a list, a book, of people that she met traveling. And she would send them Christmas cards. <laughs> and she would send them birthday cards. I mean, can you imagine what that would have been like? This little lady with pink or purple hair comes up to you and finds out about your life and is interested and chats with you and gets your name and address and your birthday and then sends you a card. It's phenomenal. And you know what? She never really liked flying. She never really enjoyed it very much, except for the fact that she got to meet people. This is power beyond our own limitations. It's the power of God that heals from disease, that brings wholeness to our brokenness, that brings life from death. That's how we face fear. We walk with Christ in the midst of that event. Be with us today. Help us today. Speak to others, visit people, wear purple hair if you want. That's the power of Christ and God and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, 
We thank you that you are with us as we face all kinds of different fear, some external, some internal, and yet we never face it alone. We always face it with you. So help us to walk and lean on your strength, to be there for other people, even in the midst of something that is frightening for us, to continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus as we walk together. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you guys will stand. We got a new one. It's new to us. It's been around for a little bit. So this is kind of quickly becoming one of my new favorites. But before we get to it, I got to tell, I got to talk up the parents here for a little bit. Your kids are so well-behaved, so awesome, so, like, inspiring and insightful. They teach me, like, every time I'm in there. So you guys are doing a great job. Let's give a round of applause for the parents here. Yeah. Doing a great job. It's a joy to be here every single day. All right. All I see is the battle You see my victory When all I see is the mountain You see a mountain And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now for I am saved with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you.
that on the rotation. I like that one. That is awesome. Um, hear now the benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord here and in the world. Amen.